Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Wherever you are in the world, we want to welcome you to today's webinar, Total Economic Impact of a Workflow Automation Solution, an Independent Case Study. I'm Tom Murphy, General Manager and Editorial Director for Simpler Media Group and CMS Wire. I'll be your moderator today, and walking you through our broad agenda, we'll go into details later. I'll have a few minutes for introductions, then 40 minutes with John Reimer, Sarah Musto from Forrester, and Ryan Degid of Nintex. Finally, we'll have our live Q&A session featuring you, our audience. A few housekeeping notes that'll make this more productive for you. The WebEx chat window is on the right column. If you don't see it, there's a little chat button at the top or bottom of your screen. If you click that, it'll probably pop up. When you send a chat, uh, you can address it to anybody, that lower arrow. There's a Q&A window below that. You can ask questions for our panelists anytime during the program. Address it to all panelists or our CMS Wire host. Put your question in. Don't forget to hit the Send button. We'll have two interactive polls during this program. The poll window will pop up for your voting on the right side. We'll ask the question on the left side, and then you'll see the window on the right side. Be sure to pick a radio button and click the Submit button to make sure your vote counts. And please do it promptly so that we can tally the votes and read them back to you. CMS Wire has been around since 2003. We have more than 400 editorial contributors. Many of them are folks like you. If you'd like to know more about contributing an article to CMS Wire, please click on the submissions link on the bottom of our homepage. We publish more than 200 articles a month, about 10 per business day. And our editorial topic areas include customer experience, digital marketing, social business, enterprise collaboration, and enterprise information management. Today's program is sponsored by Nintex, a leading workflow company. It delivers innovative software and cloud services to help organizations automate everyday business processes quickly and easily. For more information, please visit, you guessed it, Nintex.com. Now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce today's panel. Our first speaker will be John Reimer. He's VP and Principal Analyst for Application Development and Delivery at Forrester Research. John's a leading expert on enterprise middleware and an authority on enterprise strategies of IBM, Microsoft, and Oracle. Our second speaker will be Sarah Musto, Associate Consultant for Total Economic Impact at Forrester Research. She delivers custom models and case studies that define and quantify the business impact of investing in technology solutions. Our third and final speaker will be Ryan DeGood, Vice President of Product at Nintex. He's responsible for driving product strategy, direction, and profitability. And now it's my pleasure to turn it over to John Reimer for our first speaker today. John will be presenting our detailed agenda and will lead us through the first part of the program. John? Thank you very much. Uh, great to be with you and thanks everyone for joining. Here's our agenda for today. I'm going to spend about you know, a couple of minutes on a market overview to just provide context uh, for the study that Sarah will present, the total economic impact study that Sarah will present. And uh, and then we'll we'll lead in uh, through these uh, through the other elements here on the on the agenda. Ultimately, to your Q and A, and we certainly want to get to your Q and A as quickly as possible. So, without further ado, let me uh, put this in context for you. We're going to be talking about workflow platforms and the the total economic impact of, of one of the workflow platforms out there. These platforms um, play out in a very important context uh, within the industry. Um, we are in a new era in the industry. Um, it's characterized by lots of point, uh, mo point uh, technologies like mobile and, and uh, wearables and cloud and, and all, sorts of new, uh, all sorts of new approaches to delivering software. But we sum this all up at Forrester as the age of the customer. And in this uh, diagram, what we're seeking to show is that the age of the customer is just the, just the latest of a series of eras uh, in the industry. 
Um, and each one of these era, eras has a focus. And the focus now in the age of the customer is on using technology to really energize interactions with customers and understanding of customers, uh, essentially to, to, uh, to find, serve, and retain customers uh, over time. One of, the, one of the interesting characteristics, a crucial characteristic, uh, of this progression through time is, you'll see, is the expected or required software delivery time. As we've gone through this progression, the required software delivery time has plummeted. And at this point, we've got folks that are expecting and needing software delivered on just insane schedules, uh, you know, certainly compared to the past. So a key challenge here is how are we going to do this? How are we going to actually rise to this, uh, to this set of needs? Business process is going to be a key technology that we use to rise to this, uh, to rise to this challenge. And it's the latest, really, uh, set of challenges that we find uh, folks using business process and workflow platforms uh, to tackle. The chart uh, in front of you shows the, the base, uh, four basic uh, periods of, of evolution uh, of business process. We are essentially moving from, uh, uh, moving from a phase that was characterized by automation of uh, production processes, essentially with the goal of taking people out of the equation, typically, uh, to uh, an era that's characterized more by uh, enabling engagement uh, with customers. And we find in our research that uh, many, many customer applications, particularly mobile applications, have very sophisticated processes, automated processes uh, running behind them. Sometimes they're completely automated. Sometimes they, they also involve uh, human agents. Um, particularly business-to-business -business processes uh, really have very strong uh, uh, process uh, automation, process management requirements. Um, even the even the simplest apps may have very oftentimes have very very sophisticated uh, process logic behind them. So it's a it's a very important tool for us to use, a uh, very important set of platforms for us to use to rise to this challenge. Now, as is the case with any change in the industry, existing product categories get disrupted. Um, the the products that were associated with uh, the BPM of the last era. Uh, are oftentimes called BPM suites. They tend to be large. They tend to be very expensive. And we're seeing those, uh, those products get disrupted uh, as we move into the age of the customer. There's three major directions that we see process taking. One is well, towards, uh, uh, to address a set of, uh, of omni-channel needs, so the need to have processes that can serve web channels, mobile channels, kiosks, whatever you know, whatever channel it happens to be, uh, and multiple channels at the same time. By the way, um, and we tend to see people employing new architectures we call the four-tier framework, and process plays a very important role in those those frameworks. Cloud is a very important part of this. Many people are going to are looking to use process uh, platforms in clouds, in public clouds. And then lastly, low-code platforms. Uh, low-code uh, is a new uh, is a sort of new term we've invented to address uh, platforms that, that uh, speed development through uh, by limiting the amount of coding that you have to do. Point here is that we're seeing new forms of process platform coming into play that are better adapted to the challenges ahead of us than, than, the, than the, uh, the platforms of the last, uh, the last era. Now, I mentioned low-code. This is a very important uh, development uh, in platforms in general. Uh, again, the idea is to, re is to uh, uh, speed delivery of applications by reducing the amount of programming, the amount of code that people actually write. How do you do that? Well, typically through what are known as declarative development tools or visual tools or uh, or you know, high degrees of automation or code generation. There's a variety of techniques that are used. And the research we've been doing, uh, we've been seeing a, a lot of, uh, of interest and uptake of products that use these techniques um, because they can really slash the amount of time it takes to deliver applications initially, and more importantly, to change applications after that first delivery to incorporate new ideas and changes and corrections and new business models, et cetera. 
uh, that's part of the challenge of the age of the customer is that we, you know, we tend to, uh, customers are fickle and no matter where, no matter which industry they're in, tend to be rather fickle. Their tastes change, their preferences change, and we have to be able to roll with them. Uh, and we have to be able to, to change our software very uh, quickly uh, to deal with them. So you'll see that in, uh, in our study of this uh, low-code phenomenon, we identified process as being a very important type of low-code platforms. Uh, there are other types as well, but process is, we found, is really important, particularly when there's a, a need for human mediation. Say in a business-to-business case, you've usually got a sales rep who's, uh, who's, who's uh, discussing with the client configuration of a product or a set of products or a, or a set of options. Uh, so you got, uh, it, it comes in really handy with those human mediated, usually business to business uh, environments uh, that involve inherently complex processes. Some of the other platforms, they address other scenarios, but they're not as strong as they're not as strong at process and, the, and workflow. So we expect there's going to be a big future here, a uh, future, big future growth uh, path for process and workflow platforms that come out of the age of the customer. There are already process and BPM and processes is already a very strong, uh, you know, element in a lot of architectures. Um, so, uh, hence, uh, we expect a, a very bright future here. So, uh, before we continue on to the TEI study, we'd love to get your view, uh, the view of the folks on the on the call, and get a get a picture of how you're using process today, uh, or 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 how you actually how you're going to how you're going to use process going forward in the next couple of years. Right, uh, you are, John. And uh, we've come up to our first polling question, and I'll just remind our listeners that on the right side of your screen, you should now see the actual voting form. Uh, the question is, how will your organization use process platforms during the next two years? First answer, to deliver internal applications or to deliver customer-facing external applications, to deliver both internal and external applications, or you have no firm plans to use process platforms. Please check one, check one of those four windows on the right side there and don't forget to hit the submit button down at the bottom right. And while you're doing that, and we're tallying the results. We're going to read them back to you in just a half a minute. I want to ask John where he thinks most of the voters are going to come in on this. Now we're talking within well, the framework of two years. What do you think, John? I obviously I <laughs> see a big future in customer facing, so customer facing applications. So um, I'm, I'm expecting that's where it'll come out. But I wouldn't be surprised if it's deliver both. Because uh, yeah. there's, a, there's an awful lot of value in automating internal processes as well, uh, and that'll continue going forward. So what do we yeah, have well, here? Yeah, well, I think our uh, results are in. Let me see if I can get them up on my screen here. So it looks like both. Uh, you know, I'm just having a little trouble reading them on my screen. I, here we go. I can read them. I've 40, got them. 44% okay. say both, both, right? Yeah, 44% came in with both. 4% said customer-facing, 7% said internal, and 4% said they had no firm plans yet. Folks, I see 41% of you didn't vote at all. Uh, it is your right to vote, and more important, it does help our, our program uh, to know exactly what's on your mind. So this is a very useful answer. I want to thank our audience for that. And, John, I think it's time to uh, turn the control over to Sarah. It is indeed. Let me uh, get on the slide 19 and do that. And we'll, we'll hear what right. she has to say. Hi, everyone. Again, this is Sarah Musto from the Forrester TEI team. Before we get to the actual TEI case study, I want to take a few minutes to describe what is total economic impact. So let's talk about TEI. We built this methodology about 15 years ago because we realized that next level business case justifications were becoming increasingly important, especially for technology investments. Through our in-house surveys, we learned that over 90% of the IT decision makers that we polled found value in a business case. And so the question became, what is an effective business case? TCO analyses covered the important categories of costs and avoided IT costs. Traditional ROI analyses take it one step further 
and include categories of tangible business impact like efficiencies and incremental revenue. And a full TEI analysis is the final step, including risk adjustment for adoption rates, the risk of going over budget, or general uncertainties when implementing a technology solution. And also flexibility. How can this investment today directly enable future investments that can yield additional benefits? We believe that for technology investments, a TEI approach will provide a realistic and conservative approximation of the value that you will receive. And here you can see again the four components of the total economic impact analysis, benefits, costs, flexibility, all filtered through the risk lens. The final product is the TEI case study, which details the dollar value of these categories and financial metrics like ROI, MPV, and payback period, which we'll be going through later in this presentation. Our approach is fairly straightforward. We start by gathering insight from Forrester analysts, in this case, that's John Reimer, and also from subject matter experts at Nintex to build a foundation for the discussions with current customers. Then we talk to the, to the customers to understand their experience before and after the decision to invest. We then take what we learn from the customers to create a financial model, write the case study, and deliver on add-ons like this webinar. And the final case study is validated by our Forrester analyst, the experts at Nintex, and most importantly, by the customers we speak with. As a third-party independent research firm, we have to include these disclosures in all of our materials. I'm not going to read through all of these, but I do want to call out a few key notes. This is an abridged version of the full case study. If you'd like more detail on the topics that we cover during this call today, please go download the study from the Nintex website. The results of the study are based on a select sample of five current Nintex workflow customers. In order to remain objective, we limit the scope of our analysis and model to what we hear directly from these customers. We do, of course, encourage you to take the framework from the study and plug in your own numbers to get a more personalized ROI estimate. And finally, while the study was commissioned by Nintex, Forrester does not endorse Nintex, and we do maintain editorial control during the creation of our case study. So now that you have some background on TEI and our methodology, let's dive into the case study results. If I were asked to summarize the results of the case study in just one sentence, it would be that Nintex enables increased productivity and simpler workflow development, resulting in a three-year ROI of 176%. Now, I'm sure most of you have a good understanding of Nintex's solution. Nintex provides a workflow platform that helps organizations automate business processes. And through the use of its components, including Nintex forms, mobiles, and connectors, aspires to improve the way that people, process, and content are brought together. The use of Nintex's workflow platform by a composite organization, which is an average of our five customer interviewees, over a three-year period yielded a risk-adjusted ROI of 176%, a net present value of slightly over $1 million, and a payback period just shy of 11 months. And in the next several slides, we'll go into more detail on the cost and benefit categories that contribute to those high-level financial metrics. And we'll also discuss how you can start thinking about what the impact of this investment would be for your organization. I mentioned in the executive summary that we are viewing the results of a composite organization that's representative of the five interviewees. This fictional organization has the characteristics and customer journey most commonly heard in the interviews. We took the data points from those interviewees and averaged them and scaled them for our composite. It's a US-based global organization. Uh, prior to investing in the workflow platform, it had a number of paper-based manual processes. And the organization was trying to automate some of those processes through the use of custom code. It had also standardized on a collaboration and content management system like SharePoint or Office 365. In that prior environment, the organization was facing a number of process challenges. Relying on custom code to automate some of those processes was often quite painful. It was time consuming and it was inflexible to changing business processes. And this meant that automation was too slow to keep up with business demand. And the resulting pipeline of requests for automation was Training the relationship between business and users who were looking for efficiencies in conducting their operations and interacting with customers, and IT, who were struggling to keep up with this demand with the technology that they had. 
This also meant that a lot of processes were made manual and were prone to the errors and inefficiencies that accompany manual processes. And so the organization in reaching out to Nintex was looking for an automation solution that could help in, to solve these challenges and also interact easily with the content and collaboration solution that they had in place. The organization selected Nintex workflow and Nintex forms. Some of the key features that stood out were the intuitive workflow designer, the logic and flow, the ability to integrate with other systems within a workflow, and the overall ease of use. The key results centered on two areas of focus. Uh, the first, the organization with Nintex was now able to automate processes in pace with business demand, which enabled time savings for both business users and IT. Fewer process errors and delays because of this automation, and better compliance. And the organization was able to do this because automating processes with Nintex as compared to using custom code was simpler, faster, and it opened the door for a partnership with business users who now had the ability to automate some processes on their own. Two quotes from our interviewees highlight some of these benefits. The first, because delivering workflows with Nintex is quicker, the organization is now able to spend time analyzing the process and to make sure that they are delivering something in a smarter way. And the second quote, the organization had several situations where they need workflows to talk to other systems. And the fact that they can do that with Nintex is a winning factor for them. And we have several other quotes like this included in the case study if you are interested in hearing more. In the case study, we have two categories of benefits. We have quantified benefits, for which we have a dollar value and non-quantified benefits, which the interviewees felt were quite important but were unable to measure. I want to start with the quantified benefits. We have two types of quantified benefit, which probably look quite familiar to you by now. The first is productivity improvements, efficiencies gained through the use of workflows. And this affects business and users who have access to those workflows, and also IT FTEs who may use some of those workflows as well. And over three years, the present value of the productivity improvements for business end users and for IT FTEs is valued at about $1.4 million combined. The other type of quantified benefit is cost savings in terms of less resource time required for workflow development and management as compared to the previous environment. And the present value of those costs over three years is just under $200,000. So let's look at each of these two categories in more detail. The first benefit is business and user productivity improvement. And on the next slide, we have IT FTE productivity improvements. The composite organization focused on automating business processes, which represent about nine relevant to business users into simple workflows and complex workflows. Simple workflows uh, being workflows automating one to five step processes to so think minor expense approvals, vacation requests, and time tracking. Complex, work, complex workflows automating processes that have five up to 50 steps or more involve a number of different people or departments and commonly include integrations with other systems. So for example, opening an account for a new customer or requiring global collaboration on a deliverable or a large capital expense approval. For your organization, these definitions may slightly differ, and that's OK. You'll just want to think about, for each bucket that you create, what are the time savings? And for our analysis, most of the workflows are on the simpler side, but the complex workflows tend to save users more time. I've included here how we calculated this benefit. First, consider how many workflows are used in your organization on average for a specific time period. We chose per week because that was easiest for interviewees to estimate with the most accuracy. But per month or per year could work as well. And on average, how much time using these workflows saves users compared to how the process was conducted before. For our analysis, we assume that on average, users will save an hour with each use of a complex workflow and 15 minutes for a simple workflow. Then estimate for your users, what is the average fully loaded compensation? And when we say fully loaded, we refer to salary plus the value of benefits. And this helps us to put a dollar value on that time saved. And finally, consider a productivity capture. We know from our own experience and our experience creating these models that not all time saved is actually used productively. If you get 15 minutes back in your day, how many of those minutes will you use to complete more work? And how many will you use to grab another cup of coffee or 
catch up with a coworker. And so to ensure that we take into account this tendency in our behavior so that our estimates are more realistic, we reduce the value of this benefit. So for our analysis, the productivity capture was 50%. And at the bottom of the slide are the three-year risk-adjusted totals for this benefit. And I'll leave you with a key takeaway and a note on this benefit. The takeaway is that the significance of this benefit and the following benefit for IT productivity gains depends on the opportunity available within your organization to automate processes. If, like with our composite and our interviewees, you have several staff at a medium to high salary level that are confined by manual processes or that have some automated processes that are inflexible to the agility needed by the business, then this benefit is going to mean a lot to you. And a note uh, to think about is that the first level of quantifying resource and time savings from a technology efficiency is translating that time into dollars, which is what we've done here. The next level of this benefit is how you will reallocate that time or that resource to add additional value for your organization. The second benefit is IT FTE productivity improvement. This benefit is modeled in the same way as the business end user benefit. Again, workflows relevant to IT FTEs are separated into complex and simple buckets based on the degree of de development and process simplicity. To calculate the value, of this benefit, we need to consider how much time is being saved by IT FTEs who are using the, these workflows as compared to the previous manual processes. We also need to consider the average fully loaded compensation for IT FTEs and the estimate of productivity capture. And again, I would offer that the, the key takeaway here is just like with the last benefit, the more opportunity you have to automate processes used by IT FTEs, the more this benefit will mean. And the third quantified benefit is cost savings in the form of time savings in developing workflows with Nintex versus developing workflows with custom code. Nintex is a low code platform. It's very user friendly. And so developing and modifying workflows is less time consuming. On average for our interviewees, they saw a 60% reduction in time needed to develop a workflow and a 20% reduction in time needed to manage and support those workflows. In order to make sure we, we don't double count, there are two ways to model the savings. The first is to consider the net savings in the benefit side of our equation and make sure that we don't include the costs, uh, the time needed to develop workflows on the cost side. The second way, and the way that we chose in order to expose that development time needed with Nintex, is to put the cost avoided on the benefit side, so how long it would have taken to develop and manage the same workflows with the old system. And then on the cost side, include the cost for development with Nintex. And in the model, those will net out to our cost savings. To calculate the cost avoided, the time it would have taken to develop the same number of workflows in the prior environment, we want to estimate the amount of time the organization would have spent developing the same number of complex work workflows and also developing the same number of simple workflows. And this is based on that 60% differential that I noted before. We also want to estimate how much time would have been spent on management and support. And this is based on the 20% differential mentioned above. And finally, to put a dollar value on that time, we also include the average fully loaded compensation. The key takeaway, again, focuses on what that freed up time means. For most of the interviewees, it meant that workflow development could happen at a more rapid pace without having to increase resources. And lastly, I do want to touch on the non-quantified benefits that were uncovered during the customer interviews. First is the ability to collect and share best practices across the organization. With uh, Second is better compliance with external regulations through the use of workflows and the ability to easily change those workflows as regulations change, and this results in reduced litigation costs and reduced fines. Third is that due to the process efficiencies um, created through the use of workflows, some customers found that they were able to complete additional projects and that those projects resulted in a positive revenue impact. By now, you're probably asking, what does this all cost? There are three main buckets of costs associated with an investment in the workflow platform. And I'll show 
you the calculations of these on the next slide. The first bucket is rather straightforward, license and support costs for components of the platform that you want access to, so for a composite that was the on-premise version of workflow and form. The second bucket is for training. For all of our interviewees, this was a very minimal time commitment and cost. Typically, there were a few hours of formal upfront training for the IT FTEs or business users who would be developing and managing workflows. Any other training done internally was ad hoc, very minimal, typically referring to some posted documentation. The third bucket of costs is resource costs for the development and management of workflows. All of our interviewees relied on a mix between professional services staff, IT FTEs, and business users for the development of workflows. And to clarify, these are existing IT FTEs and business users, not additional hires. There were some commonalities for this mix across our interviewees. All the interviewees implemented the Nintex platform with IT resources, and all were able to do so fairly quickly. The most common use for professional services was for the development of an initial batch of, or set of workflows. These tended to be more complex, involve migrating workflows from prior systems, and so IT would work with the professional service, services staff during the initial time period. And following this initial use of professional services, development of workflows shifted mainly to IT FTEs. The discussions I had with the interviewees about allowing end users to develop their own workflows was quite interesting. There were definitely a cautious desire to let end users automate processes on their own, but there was also a concern about balancing this flexibility in workflow development with the ability to govern workflows. Only one of our interviewees pushed the self-service nature of Nintex and fully empowered users to build workflows at their own discretion. But they admit that governance was difficult. And by governance, I'm referring to knowing what workflows exist, ensuring those workflows meet standards set by IT, knowing how often those workflows are being used, among other things. Additionally, for the more complex workflows, end users would often ask the IT team for help or use a third party. And so time and skill constraints on end users would still route some of that more complex workflow development back to those sources. So really interesting topic, a lot of different approaches and philosophies on how to divide this responsibility. Certainly, any of, any of these three resources are able to automate with Nintex. Um, it's an organization-specific decision you want to consider when you model your own business case. For the purposes of our analysis, based on our customer interviews, the composite organization used IT FTEs to implement Nintex, used a combination of IT FTEs and professional services to develop an initial set of workflows. And then in years one through three, uh, the IT FTEs took over a majority of workflow development including the development of all complex workflows, and in years two and three started to open up development of simpler workflows to business specialists, who are business and users in different regions who are trained on workflow development and can assist the business and work uh, closely with IT. I'll quickly show you how to calculate each of these cost components. Down the right side of the slide are the three year risk adjusted costs for each cost category. Along the bottom of the slide are the year by year total costs. For the Nintex licenses, there is an upfront license cost for each product, as well as yearly software assurance. The usage of professional services, you'll need to consider how many people you use, the hours they each spend over the time you've used them, and their hourly rate. And for IT FTEs, you want to include total hours spent up front on implementation, total hours spent each year on development, and total hours spent each year on support. Similar for end users, you'll want to include total hours spent each year on development. Additionally, most workflows require a few end users to validate requirements and for testing, and so those hours need to be included as well. And then finally, for training, for any IT FTEs or end users who get uh, some sort of formal training, you'll want to include those hours as well. I want to talk about two additional factors that make this a TEI study, future flexibility options and risk adjustments. Flexibility, as Forrester defines it, is the ability for a customer to do something cheaper, better, or faster in the future because they made an investment in a technology, in this case, an Intex platform, today that directly enables them to make an additional investment. The interviewees mentioned two flexibility options, the ability to invest in Intex connectors and Intex mobile. They believe these investments would further improve productivity as more processes are able to be automated, and also because those workflows could then be accessed through users' mobile devices. 
However, the interviewees had not yet made those investments, so we were unable to quantify that additional value, but something, again, for you to consider for your organization. Where we talk about value, we have to also talk about risk. For this case study, we considered both implementation risks that would cause costs to be higher than the original estimates and impact risks that would cause benefits to be lower. The main implementation risk is the variability of resource costs. That variability depends on the skills and salary and house, the rate and usage of professional services, and can lead to higher costs for the development of workflows. The first impact risk is around productivity. These two benefits can be difficult for organizations to track and estimate, and they are subject to the level of adoption, the availability of workflows for frequently used processes, and the likelihood of users to be able to capture any freed up time for additional productive use. And the second impact risk is for the cost savings in developing workflows compared to the previous environment. Again, that differential could sometimes be hard to measure or estimate, but we didn't view this to be as big of a variability factor as the other two. And we take each of these risks, we assess their impact and likelihood, and come up with a mean that enables us to adjust our financial model into a more conservative picture. And uh, with all that said, let's zoom out quickly and take a final look at the overall financial snapshot. Here are the risk-adjusted benefit and cost totals over the three years of our analysis, as well as the three-year present value. Since this is a cash flow analysis, we apply a 10% discount rate to get the present value figures. The net present value, again, is slightly over a million dollars. The ROI is 176% over these three years, and the payback period is 10 and a half months. We've also charted this to provide a different view. You can see here that there is a heftier upfront investment, mostly because our approach that we modeled used some professional services initially before development shifted to IT, FTEs, and workflow usage began. You can also see in years one through three that with minimal investment in additional workflows, the benefits continue to scale quite nicely. And with that, I'll hand it over to Tom and Ryan for another poll question. Thanks, Sarah. And that was a tremendously great presentation. You just gave a lot of detail. And you should see the uh, actual voting form on the right side of your screen if you don't click on the polling tab, and it should pop up. And the choices are 1 to 10, 11 to 50, 51 to 250, or more than 250. How many workflows has your organization automated? So, Ryan, what do you think that's going to come in uh, based on your experience? Well, Tom, I think there's, um, there's likely to be a, a fair spread here in terms of the results that we see. I'm uh, hopeful that some of our customers are on today, and so we'll see some higher numbers. Um, but I expect you'll find a lot of people are down in the kind of 1 to 50 range at the moment. Okay, good. Well, as soon as our uh, results are posted, we'll read those back to our audience. I think uh, you're probably right that we'll see a spread over here. And I'm just waiting for our results to be tabulated. The poll has ended, so you can't vote again. Hopefully, I'm surprised, and everyone's in the 250 plus category. <laughs> what what should it be for the kind of organization we're talking about? Is it the C 51 to 250, or is it higher? Um, I don't want to give away too much, actually, because I've got some stats okay. to share with the group. That's um, so. Here we go. We've got the results, and that's yeah, kind do. of the spread I would expect. So, I mean, obviously, you can see a, a kind of a classic long tail there. We've got a lot of people focusing on that one to ten um, sort of core processes yeah. in yeah, their business. 20, 23 twenty-three percent are on one to ten, and then uh, fifteen percent is at eleven to fifty, which is our next most popular answer. Eight yep. percent on fifty-one to two fifty, and only four percent at two fifty or more. About half our audience uh, apparently isn't sure because they didn't vote. So <laughs> if that's the way it goes. Yes, and it turns out I come from Scotland, so I'm used to a much higher voting uh, percentage in recent times. So uh, yeah, that's um, those are looked on. Those are fantastic results, and uh, you know it really helps set the scene for just a quick wrap up here, following on from um, you know from John and, and Sarah's information. So you know what you're seeing uh, here in terms of these results is is fairly indicative of, of what we see in the industry today. Now, many organizations taking a, a pretty top down approach to process automation. There tends to be a, a center of excellence or process excellence in the business. And you know you're tackling a small set of problems with a heavy reliance on corporate IT. Um, Brian, and, why don't you uh, go ahead and flip to your next slide? You can start that presentation. Yeah, and so 
you know, the, uh, you know, as we wrap up, I'd just like to take a few minutes to talk about the, the approach Nintex takes to workflow automation, uh, how we empower more people to automate more workflows than ever before, and what I think I can do to, to dramatically shift, uh, you know, the thinking of the, the people who are on this uh, session today about how they can go from that 1 to 10 category to 250 and beyond up to levels that potentially some folks just, just couldn't even possibly imagine before, uh, before this discussion. So just to, to set the scene, um, you know, in the last 40 minutes or so, we've heard from uh, you know, select how a select group of Nintex customers are using our platform to automate problems in their business. But it's worth giving a little bit of context for the folks here today about who Nintex is, who our customers are, um, so you can understand where this sample comes from. So Nintex is a, a you know a world leader in the in the workflow automation space. We have over 5,000 customers today. Those customers are spread around 90 countries in the world, 22 languages. We have over 8 million people using our software today. And uh, you know, interestingly, we're the number one ISV in the SharePoint and Office 365 space. But also, we have a channel of over 1,100 partners worldwide you know, who help implement solutions on our platform. And that's really you know, how, we, how we differentiate ourselves in the marketplace. So uh, with that said, with over... 5,000 customers, a lot of people ask, well, you know, hey, Nintex, where do you specialize? You know, in this process automation space, often companies specialize in a, a particular vertical, or maybe they've got a, a focus on a particular business function. Um, but that's one area where we, we take a slightly different approach. You know, at the end of the day, our customers span every industry, and they're looking to solve problems across their entire business, from sales to finance to HR to operations and beyond. And, you know, with over 1,100 partners worldwide, we then have a network of highly skilled workflow professionals who can provide specialization in different geographies, industries, and business functions. So we take a holistic approach, and those partners, along with our customers, then drill down into the specifics of, of your particular organization. And on the screen right now, you can get an idea of a quick sample of the types of problems that can be solved with our workflow platform, but really the potential is limitless. And I'll give you an idea in a few minutes of just how far you can go beyond tackling you know, just this set of problems you see in front of you here across marketing, IT, finance, product management, facilities, and the likes, um, you know, to solving literally thousands of problems within your business. So, you know, nothing sums it up better than a, a, a real customer proof point. You've heard from a few of them, but, um, you know, one of the things I, I really like to do is, is call out a, a classic example of a company that I'm sure everyone can imagine has some highly sophisticated workflow requirements and a lot of processes and a lot of benefits to be gained from automating those processes. And in this case, it's Costco. Uh, and as you can see here, you know, the quote from Jason, he's essentially saying, look, I didn't need to employ and train 10 developers um, to do what I did myself with Nintex. And 10 developers, I can tell you in the space we play, fully loaded headcount is typically about $2 million per year. So basically, Jason is saving his organization $2 million per year just by being an empowered individual. Uh, and that's really how we, we make a difference. We're focused on taking everyday users and turning them into workflow professionals who are empowered to solve their own business problems without needing to turn to, to an army of developers because most organizations don't have or can't afford an army of developers today. So what's our approach? How do we, you know, how do we make things different? Well, basically, it's about taking a holistic approach to a workflow platform. You know, in the in the, the last 20 or 30 years, there's been a lot of process automation technologies emerge, uh, but everything tends to be highly componentized. And what we look at is really providing an end-to-end -end set of tools and technologies um, to allow people to build applications to solve their business problems without having to resort to developers, without having to write code. You know, as Forrester pointed out in the TEI and a lot of their current research, this rise of the, the low-code, no-code no platforms is really something that's starting to have a big impact on, on the types of solutions people are building. So we basically start by enabling people to quickly model, publish, and adapt their workflows. We empower everyone to become an application builder, um, to be able to build sophisticated forms-driven applications with advanced business logic. We, with a single click, can take those applications and make them mobile, native mobile applications on every platform that can help you capture all the data that that platform provides, whether that's pictures, video, audio, GPS locations, barcode scanning, near-field communications. And as this world of cloud platform services and data sources begins to explode, we make it easy to connect to all those different services without having to know how to code against APIs, understanding REST, parsing XML, uh, or getting your developers on board. So everyone can do that quickly and easily. 
So, you know, I promised some big numbers just before, uh, and hopefully this really starts to open people's eyes to exactly what's possible if you take this different approach. If you take a bottom-up approach, if you focus on empowering everyday users to solve their own problems, just how far you can go. So this is a sample of, you know, some of our customers who've really gone above and beyond in this space to solve problems within their business. So the first number you've got here is 12,000. That's the number of workflows automated globally by a single customer of ours, one company in the chemical engineering space who has automated 12,000 process problems in their business. Now, you don't automate those problems by having developers do it. You don't automate those problems by relying on corporate IT. And you can't have that many problems solved without constantly having those solutions adapt to the needs of your business. Beyond that, um, because we focus on this idea of empowerment, um, you really want to look at you know, what you can do, uh, both within your organization and working and partnering with Nintex to help arm more people to achieve more. So as an example, we have a customer who has a Nintex center of excellence where they have internally certified over a thousand people to become workflow professionals to build and work on workflows in their organization. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, okay, Ryan, well, 12,000 workflows, are these small workflows, big workflows? So, you know, at the upper end of the scale here, we have people who have modeled out workflows with over 5,000 unique steps in order to bring some order to chaos within their organization. And you might be asking, is this small transactional throughput, large transactional throughput? As an example, in the automotive manufacturing space out of Japan, we have a customer who has a single workflow that runs over 400,000 times per month. So that's the scale of what's possible if you open up the world to the individuals who are out there every day trying to get things done faster and more effectively within the organization. So, you know, you can take my word for all of this, but I've got a few calls to action. Obviously, the reason we wanted to partner with Forrester on this total economic impact study was to give you an independent perspective on what's possible. And I'd encourage you to go and download the report, read it for yourself, and get an understanding of how far you can go. And uh, obviously, reach out to us or Forrester if you have any questions. Uh, I'd encourage you to go to nintex.com, learn more about who we are, what it is that we do. But most importantly, I'd encourage you to start building workflows today. We make it very easy for anyone to get a, a fully functional trial of our platform. Uh, we make it easy to get in touch with our community, where we have thousands of users who are more than willing to help you and provide their experiences and background. Uh, and you can get in, you can start playing with the technology, see what's possible, and then get up and running very quickly. Hopefully, you've seen from the TEI that the ROI on these kinds of solutions comes very quickly uh, and is very quantifiable. So with that, uh, I'll hand it back to you, Tom, and it uh, looks like it's time for some Q&A from the uh, people on the call. Thanks, Ryan. Great wrap-up, and those were some big numbers you, you offered at the end there. And now it is time for my favorite part of the program. No offense to any of our great speakers, but I love hearing from the audience. If you have a question on your mind for today's program, please get down to the Q&A module, paste it in there, and hit the Submit button, and we'll make sure we get, get that on our list. Uh, meanwhile, we have about, uh, oh, let's see, about 11 minutes to get through, and we do have some good questions already in the hopper. Eric Halsey asks, what are the ways to calculate benefits for the stuff that was not quantified in this analysis? For example, reduced errors, more visibility, reduced litigation costs, those sorts of things. And I, I'm thinking that John or Sarah might want to take a swing at that one. Any volunteers? Yeah, I'll start. Uh, we are limited in the scope of our analysis based on the interviewees we speak with. And so we can on only quantify what they see and what they are able to measure on their own. And some of these miscategories are either hard to measure in general or are hard to attribute to a specific technology. And so it's, it's always best to err on the side of caution when you are creating these business cases. In terms of ways to calculate these additional benefits, some of these, for example, reduce errors or more visibility into where a process is, those issues usually result in time drains, and so they roll into that estimate of efficiency gain. For those situations where errors may result in something a bit more serious, like, for example, a lack of compliance with regulations that can cause litigation or fines, you'll want to think for your particular organization, how often on a yearly basis do these failures to adhere to correct processes result in that litigation or, or fine? How much does that cost you on average each time it happens? And then consider that to be a benefit of avoided cost and add that to your analysis. You may also want to think about a risk adjustment. 
Um, for example, for compliance costs, can you ensure full adoption of automated workflows so that these process errors that cause litigation can be eliminated? And if not, you may want to hedge for that uncertainty. The only thing I'd add to what Sarah, the only thing I'd add to what Sarah said is, in my experience, very few people, very few organizations collect, um, quantify these factors. Uh, it's just it's too difficult, and the payoff, they just don't see a, a payoff in doing so. It's it's frustrating as researchers, we'd like them to quantify everything, but um, yeah. it's hard to get this. I was going to say one thing I'd add to that, John, is that uh, you know quite often what we see when we we go down this path is you know how you measure the ROI of specific vectors like this, mm -hmm. and you end up in a position where often the cost of of quantifying it, you then start to ask yourself, well, you know the benefits are obvious. Um, do right. we really need to quantify it? By the time we've done that, what actual you know what impact is that having? I think the interesting thing about this question to me is that somebody's asked it, right? Because yeah. one of the biggest problems historically in the BPM space is this laser focus on, you know, it's about cutting costs, it's about, you know, increasing throughput, it's about, uh, you know, really sort of slicing and dicing and building a lean, efficient organization. And, you know, to your point at the start of this call around the focus on the customer-facing aspects of business process, the real opportunity that we see comes from, you know, how do I drive a faster pace of innovation in my company? How do I deliver a higher level of customer service and, and satisfaction? Um, how do I, you know, increase uh, my compliance in, in a world of, of greater transparency than ever before? And the sheer fact that people are putting that lens on it in yeah. itself is beneficial, right? And I'll give you a classic example of this uh, just internally. Uh, you know, we're going through a, a significant period of growth in our company right now. Uh, we're hiring developers as fast as possible. And, you know, every day I go without a developer, there's a day that I'm losing eight hours of coding, mm -hmm. right? Now, you may say to yourself, well, hey, HR process, let's focus on how fast we can hire people. But it really boils down to how fast can my company turn out new product and new capability for my customer? It's not about how fast I'm hiring the developer. Uh, and so putting that lens on it um, encourages I think, people to think about solving more problems in general. Right. And Good. by the way, by the way, I, I don't think we're I think it's we should say that we're not trying to denigrate the question. It's a it's a it's a good question. It's just that there are different priorities at play often. Um, and uh, and and many people just don't collect this data, unfortunately. Yep. Makes sense. Let's move on to our next question. And this is from Grace Chi. How, has there been any pushback on the productivity gains? For example, I can imagine that the for productivity capture, there may be questions regarding how much value a company can actually capture. How do you defend your numbers? Um, again, I think Sarah or John might want to take a swing at this. Well, one. Sarah, did you did you did the interviewees mention pushback, and uh, did you encounter any? Did they report on any uh, uh, resistance, such as being as being described here? No, you know, I, d I didn't hear very much pushback. I think the, the benefits were rather clear in terms of efficiency mm -hmm. gains, and that's why we include them. Uh, we were able to get data points from from each of the interviewees, and this was a clear front runner in terms of benefit category for them. Mm -hmm. um, I would I would also add that you know just sort of in general, in thinking about these soft benefits, it is certainly the biggest sticking point for are more conservative financial modelers. And, and by soft benefits, you know, I refer to benefits that don't impact the bottom line in, in the same way that incremental revenue or cost savings do. And so productivity or efficiency gains and those time savings uh, would be a perfect example. And we believe very strongly that value of this time saved is really important when you consider a technology investment. You're essentially getting additional resources for no additional cost. You now have ITFDEs who can focus on higher value technology initiatives. You have business and users who have time freed up to work on important business initiatives. And so that soft benefit can lead to financial benefits like incremental revenue um, and, and like um, the ability to complete more projects. And so they are inherently more difficult to estimate. It's why we use a productivity capture. It's why we use a risk adjustment. Um, but we show that with our methodology, including these benefits, which are very is a better way to predict the overall value. You yeah. 
Ryan, it, Ryan, I think this harkens back to the point you were making as well that you know, in some in in some cases, particularly with uh, particularly in this area of customer facing uh, applications, people are just desperate. Um, so we just need better. T- you know, you hear this all the time. We need be- we need better tooling. We need better process to create more software or to fit within very very tight schedules, particularly with marketing and direct marketing and sales and and, and internet selling and all that. Oftentimes you're you're dealing with just brutal schedules, uh, you know, campaigns that 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 where the software has to be built right away, and so, yep, you know, it's all it's all just a matter. It's really efficacy, not efficiency. That people That's right. are worried about a classic example here again. You know, they'll talk about the the world of Nintex. We we have you know continuous deployment now as a as a cloud service provider. We have products on monthly release get schedule, uh, bi-monthly release schedule, and then quarterly release schedule. And when you try to crank that pace of innovation, not just in R&D, but also in, t- in terms of getting message to market, you really need efficiencies. You really need consistency and execution because you no longer have you know, a year or three years up your sleeve for a mm-hmm. big bang product launch where everything can be carefully scheduled and managed by a PMO. Things just to have, have to happen very quickly, very uh, in a very agile fashion. Mm-hmm. Good. We have just a few minutes remaining. We have a lot of questions, and I want to tell our audience we will forward all these questions on to our guest today. On your screen right now, you can see their contact information, and uh, please reach out to them if you have other questions from today's program. Our next question comes from Mark Jones. Many workflows carry data from the associated record of business, which could be paper or electronic files. Do you feel that business workflows and document management are mutually required for a true end-to-end solution? I think, uh, Ryan, do you want to take a quick, uh, yeah, quick answer sure. at that? Um, you know, here's one of the things. We, we, are, we play you know, very well in the SharePoint space, and there's a great reason for that. SharePoint is, you know, by far and away, the number one intranet portal and ECM platform out there. And a large percentage of the processes we automate um, exist in that platform because they they're heavily dependent on documents and 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 uh, you know uh, records within the organization, both from a consumption perspective, uh, so classic you know reviews, approvals, um, annotation type cycles, uh, through to complex document assembly processes, uh, through to end to end document lifecycle management, and so the two are I think. Uh, mutually beneficial to one another and obviously as you know we've seen the explosion in the last few years of these you know cloud file sharing service is your dropbox google drive um, box.net citrix share file and the likes uh, you know we've opened up our platform to those kind of services uh, as people look to move information assets within those environments between those environments uh, you know, for collaboration or, or sharing purposes. And so I think the two are very happy bed partners, uh, but they're not exclusive. You know, one of the things we did early on is sort of move beyond that world of, of document-centric workflows um, to really looking at, you know, form-driven, uh, mobile-driven, data-driven processes. And so a lot of what you see happening right now uh, is very much, you know, mobile data capture. It's the road warrior scenarios. It's, um, mm-hmm. you know, people driving processes as sophisticated as, uh, you know, FDA drug trial approvals and the like. So very data centric as well. But what comes out of that is take a lot of that data, munch that data into templates, um, generate PDFs. PDFs become business records. So again, there's a, there's a strong interplay there. Hopefully that, I, yeah. I would just add that the other thing that I see uh is forms. Yep. Forms are a crucial part of end-to-end for a lot of scenarios. Okay, I, I think that's going to have to wrap it up today. We are at the end of our program. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being with us today. Uh, it, we we are, can't extend our thanks enough to John Reimer, Sarah Musto, Ryan DeGood for all the ideas that they presented today. If your company is interested in sponsoring a webinar like this, please contact us at advertising at cmswire.com. I also want to thank our crew today, Candace Quee, our director, John Lewis, our producer, Anton Asen, our audio chief. Signing off for our Forrester and Intech, CMS Wire, and Simpler Media Group, this is Tom Murphy. Thank you. <laughs>